buying and remodeling fixer uppers. So um, especially homes and distressed properties. We'll kind of talk about the definitions and kind of what to look for and kind of give you an idea um, why one um, might be a better alternative over the other. So I'm gonna go over that today. So kind of go through the things, um, our table of contents. We'll go through the fixer upper based on um, versus a distressed home, why you choose one over the other. Um, kind of talk about buying a fixer upper and buying the distressed home. We'll talk about kind of the differences between a foreclosure, short sale, and an REO, um, different financing options that we have, um, tips for your renovation project. And then the last thing, we'll just talk about the benefits that you received here at Home Street Bank. Um, so the first part, we'll talk about just the difference between the fixer upper and dist distressed property. So fixer upper, um, when it comes to understanding the difference bet between the two, they're used interchangeably a lot. Um, but the main thing is with a fixer up, a fixer upper, it's usually a house that you can live in. You could actually do a loan on it. It might have minor damage or maybe it's got 1972 avocado green all throughout the house. Or there's something that's different. Um, maybe you need just to update it because it's from from um, an era that you want to get, um, get it updated. So fixer upper, typically you can live in it. We can lend on it as a lender. It's something that has the basic living qualities on it. Might not be what you want, but it's something that you can fix up. Um, the next part is distressed properties. These usually need significant home repairs. Something, it might be structural, plumbing, roofing, um, health and safety. There might be a lot of issues with the house. It might've been sitting there for a while or abandoned. And so with the distressed properties, they're, they're um, usually not livable. So we have a special loan for that so we can get you into that house, but it's something you cannot live in while, while you do the work, basically. Um, so a few things, uh, distressed homes are usually fall into a couple of the categories, uh, short sales. Basically, the person is trying to sell the house, but they can't because it's not livable. Um, or it's falling into foreclosure, the bank's re, um, repossessing the house. Maybe it's already in foreclosure. Maybe the person just walked away from the house and just, I, I don't want the house anymore. Um, and then the difference with REO and a foreclosure, REO is a bank owned or REO um, real estate owned property where the bank has taken it back. It may have went to auction and nobody bought it at auction. Maybe the bank bought it back. So the bank owns the house now and they sell it. It's called an REO. Um, some may have unpaid tax liens. So, um, that's one of the reasons they may have been foreclosed on. The county may have taken the house back and the bank may have not have owned, um, taken the house back either. So it just depends on how much they owe as well with the mortgage. Um, and then usually they badly need repairs, updating, and renovation. So that's a distressed home compared to the fixer upper. Again, fixer upper is mostly cosmetic. There might be some minor things in there. So we'll go to buying a fixer upper, kind of talk about how we set up doing um, buying the fixer upper compared to how we do it with a dis distressed property. So um, some people like the challenge of um, getting the work and doing the work in and getting the house fixed up. So it might be minor stuff where you don't need a full contractor, it might be stuff where you can just go and have things replaced that you uh, that you have the knowledge to replace. If you do your carpet, your, your painting, your flooring, uh, all new appliances, maybe you, uh, new countertops, something like that. So maybe the bones are good. You just need to get a cleaned up image. Um, so fixer uppers are a great deal. In, in most cases, you get a little bit of a discount. They're not completely destroyed. It's something where you can clean up, make it look a little better, make it yours. Um, so it's a little bit more uh, budget friendly. Um, they're great starter homes. So if you want to get your first home, a little bit cheaper than normal, and then build it up, build up your equity with sweat equity. You're gonna putting in your own mo uh, money into it. Just know what you're getting into. Get your budget, and I'll talk about budgets a little bit later. Um, but get yourself set up knowing what things are gonna cost because you don't want to get in and suddenly, oop, I ran out of money. Um, that's the biggest thing that I see with customers when they buy a home. They go and do all this fixing up, but they run out of money at a certain point. So you just make sure you have the money set aside for the improvements you want to do, or if you don't, start saving up some of those. So um, we can look at that later as well. Finally, in a seller's market where houses don't stay on the market long, bidding wars are common. Fixer uppers might not be something somebody wants because they want move-in ready. So they might sit on the market a little bit longer um, if a builder doesn't come in and take it. 
that happens a lot too with fixer uppers because nobody wants to touch it. So a builder comes in and says, here, it all cash and wants it. But um, typically you find that uh, they sit a little longer because nobody wants the headache of doing all the work. Okay, next part, uh, more of the benefits of buying a fixer upper. Uh, regardless of conditions, um, you can get it at a lower price in most cases. Um, although you're spending more money on your home improvements, the sales price and down payment required to buy these is a little bit lower than most. So you don't have to have 20% down. You don't have to have 30% down. You can get in with a lot less money, 5% down, 3.5% down um, to get in. Um, again, less competition. Somebody might not want to um, bid on these homes because they, don't, they can't move right into it. They got to do all the work first, then move in um, if they don't want the mess around their stuff. Um, you decide on your improvements. You get to choose what projects are the most important and which take priority. Um, you call the shots. You are the project manager because you're probably doing most of those yourselves or you're hiring outside people to come in and do it. Typically, they're from the Home Depot contractors or the Lowe's contractors usually or uh, personal friends contractors that you can um, have come in and do one one up things on bathrooms or, or kitchens and they just they have specialties to do. Um, and then once with those increases, um, the renovations are done, your increase of your value of your home um, goes up significantly since you've updated the house. Um, so next part. Uh, drawbacks of buying a fixer upper. Again, I kind of talked about it. Get your budget in order because depending on what needs to be fixed, you might need special required, uh, require a special skill set for something that needs to be fixed. Maybe you don't have a very good knowledge of plumbing or electricity and you have to hire that out. Know, um, know what that's going to cost. Get a couple budget, um, bids on it, get the budget set up and figure out, okay, this is what we can do. Find out also how available is that person. I know with my electrician, he's a couple months out if I need him for something. So you want to find out when that electrician's available. When's that flooring guy available? Um, don't always go for the lowest bid. Take a look at the different bids. See what goes into it. Sometimes the lowest bid isn't the best because they might do shiny work. They might not do the work to your satisfaction. So um, having a little bit middle to higher bid might make sense in some cases. So Take a look at those. Don't always go for the lowest bid. Um, again, there's a significant investment of time. Um, it does take longer um, than what you anticipate to get it done. So people are like, oh, it should be done instantly. It's not going to get done. Where you'll see these guys come in and do a roof. They have five to six guys that come in, rip the roof off, put a new one on, and they're done in a day or two because time's money for those guys. So they, got, they have to get off the roof and get it done quickly to do the next one. For, uh, for someone that's buying into the house, you might take a week or two weeks to get something done or the contractor might have to wait and get something in before they can fix up the house. So take a look at it, um, kind of get a timeline with your contractor and figure out or your, who you're using to do the improvements, figure out, okay, do I have time for this? Do we need to get this done first? If it's two months out or it's a month out, maybe we should get that on the schedule first. Um, the other things that can throw off budgets if you start tearing into homes, because the big thing about, buying a, a fixer upper is you don't know what's on what the inside is. So you start tearing um, sheetrock off or um, plaster off the wall and suddenly, oh, geez, the plumbing's leaking or you have knob and tube wiring. There's something that needs to be replaced because you've opened up the wall and kind of exposed what, what else needs to be fixed besides the sheetrock. So um, things can be out of whack with, with the home once you start tearing into it. So um, that's the big thing. Um, that you won't know until you get into the, the, the insides of the house. So um, finding a fixer up. So again, most real estate agents, um, some have specialties um, with fixer up or some have REO specialties. So you just want to talk to agents that kind of know the market and kind of where to look for and um, what they're doing. Some that's just all they do is REOs. They just do real estate owned built um, properties from banks and list those. Um, so speak with your agent, find out how much experience they have with fixer uppers or distress, distressed properties. Um, that way you have somebody on your side um, that kind of knows a little about it. And they also know a lot of more contractors as well that might be able to help you. Um, but they look for the properties with you. They can usually kind of give you times of how, they've been, how long they've been on the market, how long they've been listed for sale for multiple times. Because you may see a house go up for sale for one price 
D-list did come back four months later, listed at an underprice, and you can kind of see that. So take a look and see which ones have been there multiple times or ones that have been delisted or expired. So let's say they, they had the house on the market and no one bought it. Six months later, it's still sitting there. No one's living in it. They haven't sold it. Maybe they're still um, would look at offers coming in. So, okay, next part, buying a distressed property. So this is a little bit different um, with a distressed property because most times we cannot live in those. So we can't loan on them unless we have special programs. Uh, it looks like the, the picture of the house that they have is pretty close to some of the distressed properties I've seen with customers. Um, a lot of times you'll see them where they aren't completely finished. Maybe it's a brand new house and they just didn't finish it. Um, so they're properties that are referred to homes that are on the brink of foreclosure. They've been repossessed um, by the bank or the mortgage lender. Um, real estate investors often seek these out um, for an opportunity because they can get them at a lower price in most cases because they're not livable. Um, as a bank, we cannot lit, loan on it. This house, the way it is, we can't loan on that. It doesn't have garage, it doesn't have the garage doors up, probably doesn't have electricity working. Um, the garbage has to be cleaned up, obviously. Um, and then there's probably multiple things inside that we'd have to um, get. You have to have a stove, you have to have a heating unit. Um, so there's some things that, that do need to be fixed on that uh, working plumbing and such. So, um, but the different types of properties are foreclosures. These occur when the homeowner fails to make your mortgage payments. And then the property is under repossession where the lender will actually take that back um, through foreclosure proceedings and um, sell the house on the open market. Um, so they'll take the house back. A lot of times they're disgruntled when they're taking the house back. Maybe they destroy the house. I've seen people bleach carpets, put cement down the toilets. So they can just, they can really destroy a house. So I've seen customers that go in and buy houses like this. And there's a lot of nightmares of what they can do to destroy the house before they move out. Um, and so that's where you want to do your due diligence, check out the property, figure out, okay, what's been done with this. Um, next part, real estate owned. Um, these are homes that didn't sell at auction. So let's say the house was taken back because they owed on back taxes or um, the lender didn't buy the house back once that went into um, foreclosure. Um, so it just depends on who owns it at the time. If the bank goes in and buys it, um, a lot of times these get sold at the auction steps with cash in hand. Um, and so that uh, they have these sales in each county um where you can go in and buy these houses with cash a lot of investors do that because they go in and look for a good fixer upper and then or a distressed property go in and fix it up and sell it for for a good profit um the next one is short sales um those are homeowners that are facing foreclosure but let's say their house isn't as valued as how much they owe on it so let's say they owe five hundred thousand, and it's only worth three hundred thousand right now because it's in really bad shape um, so a lot of times the, the bank will have to let you sell the house at the 300000 and forgive $200,000 worth of debt. And so that's kind of what a short sale is. So you um, kind of an extreme example of it, but you would sell the house for 300000 That 200000 is is forgiven. The seller would have to um, report that as income later on. But with the short sales, they can at least get out from under the house and the mortgage as well if they do a short sale. <clears throat> uh, reasons to consider distressed properties, lower price point. Again, we talked about because most times you can't live in the house. So it's hard to get lending on those. Um, uh, potential for financial gain. So if you're getting in at a low price and you're able to fix it up to a point where you can sell it later on for a lot more, especially if, it, if, it's, if it's a seller's market, you can make a pretty good amount of money on that house if you get a good deal on it. Um, potential home improvements, if the seller is distressed, they might not have made any recent upgrades to the property. Um, so if you can upgrade the property and um, make your money back plus, uh, plus more, so that's a, a bonus here if you're getting even more equity for your, your increase in um, upgrades on the house. Risk of buying a distressed property. Um, so you can get cost savings, but it does come with some drawbacks. Um, so you have a potential for serious repairs. Like I talked about, I had a customer that went to buy a house and they flooded the toilets with concrete. So they destroyed the, the plumbing. So a lot of that had to be repaired. Or they go in and 
I've had some where the copper was taken out of the house. All of the copper was removed out of the house completely. Um, so they're sold as is. So you typically don't get to see the house when you're closing on, on the deal. Um, a lot of times, if you're buying them on the, the steps at the courthouse, you buy them with cash, then you can open the, um, you get the keys, then you go up and see the property. So it's hard to tell if it's in great shape or not, if somebody's been squatting in there, um, what the condition of the house is. So you just got to make sure you've got the amount, the money of set aside in your budget to fix the house for what you want to get done on that, if it's a distressed property. Um, <clears throat> so, it, and there are some, some loan products we do if there's um, distressed property that you cannot live in. I've done a few of these um, and I'll talk about those shortly. Um, the other one is title issues. The previous mortgage might be wiped away in a foreclosure, um, but what about the property taxes? So the property taxes might be unpaid on the house. So you might have to settle that bill up if you do and um, get the the house from the courthouse, if you get the home and it has a delinquent owner. So you do want to be careful with that. Um, long time to close. Buying um, distressed properties reduces some of the transaction time, but it's actually the opposite because because with the short sale process, the banks have to go back and forth with the seller, get that approved. Um, and so with the, the agents, it doesn't, it can take a couple months to close with short sales. So with the short sales or the distressed property, there's a lot of going back and forth with the, the former owner, the lender, um, just depends on who owns a house at the time. So unlike the county step where you buy that with cash, once you buy it with cash, that's your house, here's the keys. But again, there might be um, more more into it than what you plan because you don't see those houses until you open up open up the house with the key. Okay, so finding distressed properties. So given the complexity and the risk with short sales, um, it's hard to do it by yourself. You want to have somebody that can get in, um, go in and look for you as a realtor. Um, find a real estate agent who specializes in distressed properties. They have a lot more knowledge on where understanding the listings. If there's anything that pop up on there, um, if it makes sense to do, um, you got to see, okay, what, what's the cost going to be on the house? What, how much is going to cost? How much is going to be to fix? What's the value now? What's the value once you fixed it? Are you going to get your return on investment with that? Is it something you're going to hold on for a while? Or is it something you're going to flip in six months to 12 months? and take your money, take your profits and go. You have to kind of weigh out what you plan on doing with that house if it makes sense um, for, uh, for the purchase price and what needs to be done with the house. A good agent will let you know, yes, this is a good price for this house. It's been on the market a while, it's distressed, but we need to, you need to do this, this and this and you should be fine. Um, they'll check the title, learn um, kind of if it's a foreclosure, if it's a short sale owned by the lenders, they'll kind of do a quick title search for you and figure out um, any setbacks with, within the property. Um, online platforms, re, uh, realitytrack.com, hudhomesusa.org can provide listings of valuable information. Um, going Additionally, driving through neighborhoods to see other houses that might be boarded up or signs of distress. Um, they might not be listed, but you could probably do a search for the homeowner and figure out, okay, is this something we can purchase? Um, that's a little bit harder because you have to go through county records and figure out who the owner is and if they are planning on selling it or if it's an estate and you have to get a hold of the estate. Um, so that can take a little bit more time. Okay, so a couple other things for uh, finding distressed properties. A um, couple sites, homesteps.com. It's a list of foreclosures that Freddie Mac has where they're selling to investors or home buyers. So you can go to homesteps.com. Those are all foreclosed homes from Freddie Mac. Uh, Reality Track, we talked about, provide proprietary information as pre foreclosure addresses, owner um, information for a monthly fee. Foreclosure.com is another website uh, for distressed properties. It does have a monthly fee as well. Um, there is. Um, See if they have it on here for um, home home steps. There is one for Fannie Mae right now, but I'm kind of blanking on the Fannie Mae one. Um, but I can get that one later if you contact me later. I can figure out what the Fannie Mae. It's uh, not Home Start, but Home Steps, and there's one there's one more. So I'll have to figure that one out. I thought it was on this slide. 
Um, the next part is foreclosure short sale REO. Just kind of cover that real quick. We've talked about it a little bit, but we'll kind of go over it real quick. Foreclosure, um, again, the lender seizes the home after borrower doesn't make payments. Um, typically it's involuntary. The lender takes legal action to take the house. Um, they're initiated by the lenders. Short sale is initiated by um, the owner of the house. Um, it's sold at a price that's less than what's owed on the mortgage. The mortgage lender has to approve the new value or the new purchase price if they're going to take a short sale. And then um, the homeowner um, needs to get the approval from the lender. So you're basically selling the house of my example of it's a $500,000 mortgage. You're selling it for $300,000. You have to get the appra approval from the lender to say, yes, we'll take $200,000 less to sell this home. And then when a foreclosure sale is unsuccessful, the bank retains its ownership. The properties are real estate owned, again, REO properties. So if somebody says difference between a foreclosure and REO. Okay, next part, financing options. So the part where I come in. So with financing options, um, no matter what option you choose, you want to get pre-approved ahead of time, pre-qualified, pre-approved. So you kind of know what your budget's going to be. Um, cause you want to know what your payment's going to be, what the current rates are. Rates are coming down a little bit right now, which is nice. Um, but the biggest one I do a lot of times is an FHA 203k loan. So this is a loan that we do at home street. There's two different types. There's one with $35,000 or less, and those are typically cosmetic. So it's nothing structural with the home. So you can't move uh, walls. You can't um, change the size of windows. You have to, if you're replacing the windows, you have to put a window, in, It's uh, let's say it's 24 by 36, and you want to put a new window in, it's going to be 24 by 36. You can't get a bigger or smaller window. It has to be the same footprint. So with the smaller 203K loan, it's for cosmetic purposes typically only. Now with a full 203K, you can do up to half the half the value of the home currently. So you can do quite a bit of fixing up with a 203K. What's nice about these is we're actually gonna base your new purchase price of the home and the value of the home off of the, at the value, um, it's the value plus the construction. So if you buy the house for 300,000, you put 100,000 into it, your loan is gonna be based off of $400,000 purchase. So we do three and a half percent down on 400,000. Now, if it's something where the value isn't going to come in at the 400,000, typically they can bump it up to 110% of the appraised value, just in case it does not come in all the way. Um, but with a 203k loan, it's great because again, we're, we're using the future value of your house to lend on, and then we do the fixing up of the house at that time. For those, we do need a general contractor we get bids, um, they do take a little bit longer to close, typically 45 days to 60 days, depending on how much work needs to be done. Um, but with the closings on those, it's nice because we start doing the work and then we will not pay for work done, uh, work until it's done. So if they did all the new sheetrock and painted it, they, we do an inspection, we come in, we inspect to say, okay, the painting's been done, the sheetrock's all done, here's your, money for your sheetrock and um, paint. So we pay it as it goes. We do not send any money out ahead of time. So that's what's nice about the 203K loans or most of our um, rehab loans. We pay them as you go. So builders need to be aware of that. Once you finish something, then we can do it. So if you're putting a foundation in, putting walls up, we have set periods of time that we go out and inspect it, usually about nine times where we go out and inspect the property up to the last inspection the last inspection is your final inspection. And then that's when your final bill comes out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next is Fannie Mae Home Ready. That's again, it's um, it's a great loan for low to moderate income home buyers. And again, it's if you have a low uh, limited cash down, 5% down um, through Fannie Mae's Home Path program. And so you could buy, um, actually it's homepath.com. So that's the foreclosure for Fannie Mae. So I apologize. I, it's right here. Homepath.com has foreclosure properties from Fannie Mae. So you can get in there sometimes even 3% down with some of those, some of their loans. So, um, but with the home ready program, you're allowed to buy the house and um, be able to fix it up with um, um, a rehab loan through Fannie Mae. So it's a good program to buy through Fannie Mae. 
Um, let's see, conventional mortgage, if you're lucky enough to find a foreclosed home that's in great shape, be able to get inspection and appraisal, you can just do a regular conventional loan on it um, with 5% down or 3%, depending on your county and income limits. Um, so you don't have to do um, a full-on rehab loan where you can just take your money and put it into it. But if it's something where you don't have the funds and you want to build those into the loan, that's when you want to do the rehab loans. So the home style Fannie Mae loan is, is more like the 203k loan. And I can go through these in detail if you have questions later on too. Um, so tips for renovation projects. So how to start your renovation pro, uh, project. So you wanna get a home inspection. So depending on the type of loan that you're looking at doing, this will help you determine what the major underlying problems with the house are gonna be. What you need to address first, um, what you need to do in your whole renovation project um, and help to eliminate many or any surprise costs that might arise. Now with a 203K and FHA loan, if you do a 203K loan, Typically, we do a feasibility study with the home inspector. They have special 203K home inspectors that will go out. They do your home inspection. They also do a feasibility study to make sure it's something that they can do with an FHA loan and figure out, yes, these are the improvements that you can do, and this will add value enough for an FHA loan. Um, and then also with the home inspection, it determines what projects you want to focus on. Um, so if you... The simple primary purpose is renovation. Um, you're simply updating the look and feel of the home. That's um, more functionality over structure. So if it's something where you're at, looking to add another story or maybe another bathroom and bedroom, um, that's where the cost can start um, increasing quite a bit. So you have to figure out what, what loan you're looking at, how much you want to add into that, where you want your payment once you have that construction completed. Um, Start a list of home improvements um, on what you want to have and start prioritizing them. Don't just focus on wants. Make sure you get the needs as well because you want to make sure that you have everything you need in that house. So it's if it's something that you think is a little extravagant, maybe dial it down a little bit or just look at the whole budget with everything in there first, then start to bring it down a little bit if you have to. Okay. And then kind of the next part is get cost estimates and research. Um, get realistic estimates. Find out, okay, is this something I can do myself? Is this something that I need a contractor for? Or is this something I could go to a box store and hire out one of their contractors to do it? Let's say they have a fencing company. They could do that or they got a plumber. Um, one of my agents went and had uh, one of the box stores come out and the carpenter completely general uh, contractor completely renovated his kitchen and bathroom. And he said it was amazing. He's never thought a box store would have a general contractor like that, but they're all um, licensed through the, the box stores and they go and work. They're usually self-employed, but they go and do work as referrals from the box store. So check out the different places and find out from friends or family. If you have contractors um, that you trust, um, get a couple bids. Don't, and it, don't just rely on one bid that you get and go from there. Get a couple bids, find out does it make sense um, to spend $5,000 on two toilets or maybe I can get those for a couple hundred dollars um, by going to the box stores um, and do it yourself. So just look at the, the time and the effort that you need to put into those. Um, also look at your um, local permit guidelines in your city and your county. Um, find out what you need, if you need anything for um, permits. Sometimes replacing a roof. Some counties need a permit to replace the roof, but it's really easy to get. They just print them out over the counter. Some places require a lot more information if you're going to renovate the house or if you're stri changing structure um, or if you're eliminating, let's say you're eliminating a garage and you're turning that into a room. Sometimes they need to know those things um, with the county if you need a permit or gui uh, guidance from the county as well. So work up your budget. Uh, this narrows your list of your wants and needs considerably. Um, you wanna find out what, what the costs and what you can afford. Um, you wanna add about 30% for unexpected costs and materials and labor costs. So if you're doing a lot of stuff by yourself, let's say you fall off the ladder and get hurt, you should at least factor it in if somebody else is gonna do the work. So if you can't paint anymore, you need somebody to come in and finish the painting. So keep that in mind. 
Um, using the renovation loan to, fin to finance your remodel. Um, this is where we need the itemized budget for the project, find out what the financing terms are. Um, we'll sit there and go over, okay, this is what we're doing. This is the contract and it's gonna do it. And that fits within the budget and it fits within um, what we can allow within your mortgage and what we're gonna pay, um, what we can have paid out of your mortgage for those improvements. So, um, and typically we <clears throat> we do vet the, the contractors as well to make sure they don't just take the money and run and um, leave you once they finish one thing and then they take the money and go. So you, we do take care of uh, the co consumer and we make sure the, uh, the work's done before we pay it out. So, okay. And then um, the next part is hiring a contractor. Um, again, don't just pick somebody out of the phone, phone book, find friends, family, interview the potential candidates, find out how long they're doing, they've been doing this. Um, if they're licensed and bonded within the state, we do check that as well within the bank um, if you're doing a 203K loan. Um, but again, don't choose a contractor with the lowest bid. I've seen tons of nightmares that way because a lot of times if they're bidding really low, they're trying to get the business and they might not be the best work out there. Um, work up a timeline, be realistic. Um, talk to your contractor and figure out what the improvements are, how long it's going to take, how that's going to affect you if, by living the house or not. So do you plan on living in the house while you rip out your kitchen? Well, you might have to have a hot plate and something else to live on with your family for a little while if you don't have a stove. So there's a lot of things you got to take it, take into consideration. If you're remodeling a master bathroom or a, a main, uh, main kitchen, do you have other resources to live in the house while you do that work? Um, be patient. Sometimes the plans go awry. Um, even with the best budget, the best team in place, you can you get obstacles. So try and overcome those. Um, and again, patience, because uh, remodeling does take a lot um, out of relationships. Um, and uh, next part, we're going to talk about affinity benefits, and then we'll open it up for questions here as well. So, so just real quick, cost savings. Um, so we give you a discount as a non-commissioned loan officer for your fees. You do need to contact us at Affin our affinity department. There's four of us in the Puget Sound area. Give us a call. We'll give you the discount um, for refinancing or purchasing. We do work with real realtors that give you up to a half a point to 1% of their commission towards your purchase price. Um, we have exclusive workplace checking. It's a free checking account. Um, it's very similar to our employee checking account. Um, we also give discounts on new vehicles and personal loans. Um, down payment assistance with affinity loan officers. We can help you navigate down payment assistance. Um, there are some programs that help you um, fix up your house with down payment assistance. If you have the need for, if you have a disability that you need things fixed up with the house, we do have a program for that. Um, I have a couple other um, resources for down payment assistance in different counties, depending on what work needs to be done on the house or down payment assistance that's needed. Um, financial tools such as this class or other seminars we do for budgeting to steps of home ownership, how to read your credit, budgeting, let's see, um, how to buy your next home. The newsletters, toolkits, podcasts, and more dedicated website, exclusive benefits for you. Um, again, and then the benefits are available to you and your immediate family members. So um, anybody um, that wants to buy a home or refinance, they can use these benefits. Um, they just have to give us a copy of your paycheck and say this, and you have to give a letter saying, this is my son or this is my, my mom. And uh, they're, um, and I work at the University of Washington. So it's a great program to be able to um, give that to your family members. And again, call us at the uh, Benefits um, Center through Affinity uh, Lending. And uh, that information with the hotline is the 206-628-0207 um, or the homestreet.com slash UW. Those um, that phone number is listened to six days a week, Monday through Friday, eight until nine every day. And then Saturdays from nine to five. Um, typically, some people may even answer on Sundays. It just depends if they have the phone on. Um, but you can call us with questions. 
Um, but we meet Monday through Friday in most cases if you want to meet in person. If you have questions for me later, my email is right there, jeff.wood at homestreet.com. Um, but I'll leave it open for any questions that you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, wealth of information. And uh, yes, uh, as, as Jeff said, if there's anybody with questions, please feel free to ask them now. And uh, the floor is also open if you prefer to voice your own question as well. Looks like uh, Vicky asked Jeff, uh, are you able to work uh, with home buyers throughout the state or only within the Seattle area? We can we can actually do the rehab loans or work with customers anywhere in Washington. Um, if you're doing rehab loans out of the states, we can do them in most cases with the loan officer in those states. Um, we don't get too many outside of Washington here if the customer's in Washington, but we do 10 Western US states right now. Alaska, Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, Idaho, Utah, Colorado. I think that's 10. Um, but we soon, um, with our merger, we soon should be, I think it's 43 states will be working. So um, that's something that's hopefully will be done by the end of the year. So, Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next question here. Uh, if you're looking to work uh, with a general contractor for a renovation, do you still recommend a 30% contingency? Or, and also, would you have any insights on HELOCs? So with, if we do a rehab loan, if we do the loan in-house, we tip, depending on if there's water and power to the building, um, if there's no water and power, sometimes they do a 10 to 20% contingency and build that into the loan. If there's water, power, um, already hooked up and it's working, it may only, it may only be a five or 10% contingency within the loan itself. The budget they were talking about is if budgeting about 30%. So that's kind of for your own peace of mind to have that extra um, contingency in there. But for a loan side of it, when we do it, it's usually five to 10%. 20% is usually the maximum that we will do for a contingency. It doesn't have, 20% is not normal. It's typically about 10. Understood. Um, and then the next question here was, uh, what financing options are available to folks that have already purchased a fixer upper home recently? Are they able to refinance to get a rehab loan uh, thereafter? Yes. And oh, actually, and I forgot to mention on the HELOCs. So the HELOCs are good if you have equity. Um, so if you have equity in the house already and you're fixing it up, you can do the equity loan um, and do that. But you can't really put a home equity loan on the house unless you have the equity built up. Um, so that's it, it's a good product to have, but you typically need to have um, the equity to start with a HELOC. With the renovation loans, you're basically doing it based on what your equity will be. Um, and then going to, um, if you have a fixer upper already, um, as long, typically, as long as the work has not been started, we can do a rehab or renovation loan now. So you can do a refinance to a, a construction or a rehab loan. So that's fine as long as the house isn't torn up. Um, so we can do a rehab loan um, if you own it right now. So it's as long as a lot of the work hasn't been started. Um, if it's small stuff, that's usually okay. But if it's all torn up and you have no bathrooms, no kitchen, things like that, typically the rehab loan we can't, we can't do. Understood. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, next question is, uh, do we need to have an account with Home Street to benefit from this program? Or is it being from an employee, a UW, uh, enough? I think specifically with the affinity, if so, you you get the affinity benefit uh, for you and your immediate family, as uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, by through UW. But um, account wise, Jeff, I'm going to leave that to uh, to you. Yeah, you don't have to have an account with us. So, I mean, we do have accounts that are that are very favorable, but you don't have to have a bank account with us. Um, we, that's not one of our requirements. I know with our new with the new bank that we're going to be partnered with, they give they're going to give incentives on their loans if you have accounts with us. 
So I've heard that. So that's something we don't do now, but I've heard that's something that they will offer where you get better rates if you bring your, your accounts to home street. So it should be interesting. Wonderful. And uh, Rumina, I think I might have just also indirectly answered your question as well. Again, uh, as long as you are employed, I think the benefit extends to you and immediate family as well. Yes. And next question, uh, do we need to have pre-approval done through your bank or can you have, will, or would Home Street accept pre-approvals from other banks? No, we, we are the lender. So if you're doing the rehab with us, you, we would do the loan. So we are not, yeah, we don't. If you have a pre-approval with someone else, um, we'd have to do an, our own pre-approval and do the loan here. I think I understood, that's the, I understood the question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, otherwise, looks like that's all the questions we had. Um, we'll hang on here for a couple more minutes, but if no other questions come through, uh, please, I want to say thank you again, everybody, to, uh, for joining today during uh, your lunch hour to learn more. And uh, again, uh, I will be sending out the, uh, this, I can send out the slides uh, following the presentation. Uh, Jeff and I will be in contact. And um, yes. Uh, Otherwise, thank you, Jeff, again, for taking Great. your time and sharing all your knowledge and experience with us uh, for today's topic and to answer any other questions that uh, anybody might have. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Yes, uh, yeah, I think that might be it for questions. Um, but yeah, with that being said, oh, hold on. Uh, Lauren asked if, uh, if HELOCs are considered risky. Uh, they're... Risky for the borrower or for the bank? I mean, the bank, it's considered risky for the bank because you're lending out a HELOC on a second mortgage typically. And so it's, as a second mortgage lender, the lender is usually not going to get anything back if the first mortgage lender forecloses. Um, the max LTV we go up to right now is 80% for a home equity line of credit. So if you owe for... Just for easy math, hundred thousand dollar house, eighty thousand dollars is what we can go up to with a HELOC minus your first mortgage. So that's how high we could go up. Um, so uh, so eighty percent if it's a um, and then if it's a higher amount, if it's five hundred thousand or higher, we only go up to seventy percent uh, for HELOCs. Now they now as a borrower, it depends if you if you use your credit wisely wisely they're not as risky um it is a line of credit it's like having a credit card tied to your house um it's a variable rate it'll change like yesterday the um fed lowered the rate a half a point our rates all went down so everybody's heloc just went down a half a point and because it changes monthly it's on your interest rate um so that's one thing that's risky i think the rates we had prior to yesterday um is going to be the highest we've had for a while um, and so it's, I mean, really with rates, hopefully they will de decline a little bit more. Um, so the HELOCs will become a little bit more, um, interesting. Um, and then the other part with the renovation really depends on how much of the renovation, the rehab loan typically would be out if you have equity tied into the house doing a HELOC. Um, that's probably a question that I'd have to answer more um, if you have your renovation started just to see kind of offline to see what would be um, how far into it you are and how much more you're going to do. Because um, typically we can't touch them once they've already started. Um, that's the downside. I've had some customers that asked me that before and typically we can't touch them after you've already started. So. Yeah, I, I heard yesterday's rate cut was probably like the biggest one and we've had in the last four years. So yeah, very interesting and, to see. Yeah, and it's for short term rates. So it's for HELOCs and it's for lending. So any CD rates out there, if you have a really good CD rate right now, they're going to start going down um, the rates on those. So mortgages, we went down about three weeks ago, anticipating this. So our rates have already come down a little bit from 
um, thinking that they were going to do a half a point quarter. If it didn't go down a half a point, our rates probably would have went up today um, because of it. So, mm-hmm. but our rates stayed the same, which is nice. So they already anticipated a half a point for us. So that's what's nice about mortgage rates. They, they're a little bit more flexible sooner. So right now, most, most interest rates um, for HELOCs are prime. Prime right now is 8%. So um, for us, we do prime plus a quarter. So it's eight and a quarter. If you do an auto pay, you get a quarter off. So it's prime, it's 8%. That's most, some some banks or credit unions do teasers. It's a six month teaser. And then they go up um, to prime, whatever prime is. Looks like that's everything. Yep, I think that might be it. Awesome. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll give everyone back the gift of time. And uh, thank you again, everybody. And uh, thank you, Jeff. Okay. Thank uh, you, Sebastian. You guys have yeah. a great day. Happy Thursday. Take care, all.